welcome everybody. Uh, today is uh, October 27th, right? Help me panelists. <laughs> I think it's the 27th today. Uh, sorry about that, folks. We, this is webinar four in our Rapidly Rebuild Your Soul Health, and we'll be talking about becoming a soul health expert. Uh, but before we start, I'd actually like to have everybody in the chat window, and there's a chat button at the very bottom of your screen. Uh, just tell us where you're coming from. We always like to kind of see where our audience is at. And let's see, nobody's uh, chiming in yet. Norway, first in New Zealand. We already have got the northern and southern hemisphere covered, so I think we're, we're in pretty good shape so far. Wow, actually, we got quite an international uh, uh, group of folks yeah. today. United Kingdom. Yeah. Austra uh, um, Australia, <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia. There's a <laughs> Sweden. <laughs> Oh. Exactly. It's all over the all over the map. Yep, Canada. This is great, great to see. All right, sounds like we got a very good international audience for today's webinar. So we've got quite a bit to cover. Let's go ahead and move us along here. So this is webinar four in our October Rebuild, Rapidly Rebuild Your Soil webinar series. And just as a reminder, uh, we had uh, three other webinars before this. If you were not attending or haven't seen them, the, they are recorded and you can go to our website and watch them. Lots of great information that was discussed in those previous three webinars. So I highly recommend if you haven't, go ahead and uh, take a look at those as well. And uh, today's webinar is going to be uh, how to become a soil health expert, talking with uh, consultants and compost producers and people who are doing lab work and so forth. Okay, uh, a little bit of housekeeping here. So what I'd like to, to, to kind of put your eyes to is that we have two buttons that you're going to be able to interact with us. And there's going to be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. And if you have questions that you want the panelists to be able to answer, uh, please click on the Q&A button. That's where the green uh, arrow is pointing to. And then we also have the chat button. And the chat button is going to be really great. And a lot of you have already have used it to tell us where you're coming from. Um, this is where you can have an ongoing dialogue with other attendees in the, uh, the webinar today. Just make sure that if you have a question that you want panelists to be able to answer, don't put that question in the chat window because it will probably get missed. It will put it into the, the Q&A button and that way we'll have it uh, teed up and, and uh, hopefully your question will be able to be chosen to be answered by the panelists. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to discuss in today's webinar. Uh, we'll do some introductions so you, you get to uh, hear from the uh, panelists that are, are going to be attending today's webinar. And then our first presentation is going to be from Catalyst Bio Amendments with uh, Keisha and Casey Ernst. And then we'll look at uh, the second presentation will be Terraforma Soil uh, with Miles Sorrell. And then the third presentation is going to be Soil Life Organics with Alan Skinner. And then the fourth presentation is going to be with myself uh, for Sprouting Soil. And then we'll have a little bit of a promo video talking about our October special and a special offer that we're, we're giving today. And then we'll have Q&A for roughly about 50 minutes. So our total time for today's webinar is going to be about two hours. All right, so let's introduce our panelists for today. So Dr. Elaine Ingham, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm wearing my Halloween costume here. Uh, <laughs> just to get us all in the right mood. Um, I think most everybody knows who I am. Um, I started all of this some 45 years ago, uh, starting to look at and trying to understand the roles and functions of microorganisms in the soil. when I first started out 45 years ago um, and talked to people about uh, what I was doing. They would always be, I've never heard of these things. Uh, you know, does this really work? And so through the last many years, um, have developed it into a school, um, research, a uh, number of different um, consultants around the world. So we're going to give you a a uh, chance to hear some of their stories, just uh, do understand that there's lots of people out there um, working with the folks to bring this conversion uh, in from a chemical toxic approach into something that works with mother nature. Okay, over to you. All right, Keisha and Casey. Hey, Casey, Keisha here. Um, yeah, we are Soil Food Web Consultants, um, and also we have a composting company. So Catalyst Bio Amendments is our composting company, and our 
old company <clears throat> was Catalyst uh, Biological Solutions, but we are now actually going to join together forces with uh, Brian Vogg here. Um, <laughs> and we have a new company called Soil Matters, um, and that's going to be our new consulting kind of tea application and spray business. So, yeah. All right. Ooh, thanks, Keisha and Casey. All right, Miles. Hi, everyone. My name is Miles Sorrell. I'm the CEO of Terraforma. Um, we are a consultancy and product provider um, that work pretty much all around the world. Uh, we started the company in 2018 uh, with my business partner, Cooper Scarborough. Um, and yeah, we're just kind of continuing to learn and, and grow and apply new concepts and innovation in the kind of regenerative and biological soil health space. Great. Thanks, Miles. Alan. Yes, my name is Alan Skinner. I'm owner of uh, Soil Life Organics based in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I have done projects I, uh, as far south as Sarasota, Florida, and all the way up into northern Georgia and kind of on the western side of Florida and all the way to Mississippi. So I've been getting around lately. And so I cover quite a bit of ground, but I've been working in the biological uh, amendment and soil food web world since about 2010. Great. Thanks, Alan. And then I'm Brian Bagg. I'm your host today. Um, I'm a soil food web consultant as well, and I own a company called Sprouting Soils. And as, as Casey mentioned, uh, I'll, Keisha, Casey, and myself and my wife will be combining our companies into making a new company called Soil Matters. So that's on the very, very near horizon for us. And you're going to hear a lot more about our businesses and what we do and some of our consulting philosophies and so forth as we go through today's presentations. So with that being said, uh, we're going to have Keisha and Casey uh, go ahead and start it off for us and uh, talk about Kyle's Bio Amendments. Go, go ahead. All right. So I guess we've already done intros, but uh, I'm mm -hmm. Casey, Keisha, um, Catalyst Bio Amendments, Catalyst Biological Solutions, yada, yada. Um, but you can go ahead and move to the next slide. Yeah, I guess the way we got started in all of this was, I believe it's the way most people, not most people, but a lot of us even presenting today, it was reading, it was reading the book Teaming with Microbes. Um, and I, I found that that book gave me just enough passion and excitement and knowledge to make just crazy decisions um, and life changes that, you know, no sane person would do. Um, we quit our jobs. We decided to move to South America so that we could um, live less expensively, but have the time to invest in just learning skills. Uh, we wanted to learn about the soil. We wanted to regenerate the soil without having a microscope and understanding there were microbes. We ended up turning to permaculture. So. Um, we found a farm <clears throat> way up a mountain, a two hour hike, straight uphill. That's our trail that we would walk up every, every time we would go home. We raised goats, we regenerated land with animals, we made compost. That was okay, it was mediocre. I'll say that now. It wasn't as good as the compost we make today. Um, and we hosted volunteers from all over the world. And we, you know, I remember the day we showed up on the property just thinking, how am I going to learn all this stuff? And now it's my job to teach these people. You know, there was a time where I was giving a tour and I didn't even know what I was talking about. You know, I was repeating what other people said. Um, but through those seven years, you know, doing just lots of handwork, um, doing everything without power, electricity, um, any sort of city systems, we saw a uh, crazy change in the property. And we were able to learn how to host people, how to teach people, and um, you know, just how to how to regenerate the slow way. Put it that way. <laughs> Next slide, Brian. And so, yeah, the property we were working on was 150 acres, which like it seems big, um, but the actual changes that we were making on the property were very like small increments. Um, you know, we would do a few acres at a time, rotating goats and, you know, doing everything by hand. Um, and we actually, while we were there, like working on this property, that's when we found Elaine's classes and we, you know, we, we would go into town and use the internet cause we didn't have internet up on the mountain and like watch classes. Um, and it just got us like, so jazz, like so excited to actually start putting this into like, into reality, like actually start using this, uh, information um, and so that's actually one of like the big reasons that actually inspired us to like move back to the United States because, you know, you can only do so much by hand and we really wanted to make big changes and we were thinking to ourselves like what could we do with a tractor like with a truck with a car like, you know, like making bigger impacts is kind of really what our um, what our goal was what our mission was. Uh, next slide. 
so yeah, it, it, it all started with, you know, the first compost pile. So we were actually involved with one of Elaine's previous schools and very similar to the way the classes are set up now, we each had to make three compost piles. Uh, I actually dug through my photos. It was a trip through time. We've been doing this for a while now. Like making these slideshows is, is fun because we really look at our progress and our story. And, and that's literally the first compost pile we made. And we, you know, got our microscopes coming from South America it was a huge investment to buy a microscope. Um, it was a big investment to get all the tools, you know, to need everything that, you know, to get everything that we needed to actually put that compost pile together. You know, when I got the microscope, I wasn't naturally good at using it. Um, it was really upsetting because I thought I was going to take right to it. I got this stuff and it took me forever to find focus. That photo on the right is actually the first microorganism we ever laid eyes on that we were able to say this is a thing like this is exciting <laughs> um, this is this is probably the start of a crazy lifelong passion that i can't even see coming um, and we still to this day don't know precisely who that is I, we think it's a microarthropod but never seen anything else like it <laughs> next go slide. ahead to the next slide brian so starting out you know at home with hand turned piles we kind of started seeing that Really, if we wanted to put this work into action, like compost is like the cornerstone to everything that we do. It's like the vessel that actually holds the life that we want to put out. So we went from small hand turn piles at home to um, and that picture on the right there where we actually found a property and just made a compost pad. I've never done that before. I've never driven a tractor up to this point. And that's our very first compost pile right there on the right. And you can see it's fairly misshapen. Um, it was too big for our turner that we had at the time. <laughs> um, the entire lot is like super muddy anytime it gets wet. Like, you know, we just went full steam ahead without actually a lot of like base knowledge and this kind of stuff. <laughs> um you can see in the bottom that's elaine came out to our that's the the bottom photo is a class that we held on site and elaine came out and actually saw that compost pile and enlightened us to the reality that it was it was wrong <laughs> <laughs> i think we're actually used as an example when you're learning in the school of what not to do in the large-scale composting section so <laughs> there's a claim to fame <laughs> But we also used that, that compost up in the corner with the beautiful fungi wrapped around it was one of our first hand turn piles that we were able to inoculate our first windrow with. Next slide, Brian. So like over time at Catalyst, we, we realized the goal was to make uniform compost that every time one of our clients would take that compost, put it under a microscope that they're going to see, you know, all the life that they expect to be there, um, you know, in min minimum numbers. And it's not that easy, you know, when you're working with these huge piles of organic material and everything is very different um, to actually get these um, solid results. So we set to just breaking our minds, bodies and souls, collecting organic material from every place that we could. We vetted our organic material producers like we were trying to find a good school for our kids. Um, it was crazy the work that we put into these first windrows. Um, when I think back on it, I'm like, it was crazy. But I think it's what really set us up for success, um, just kind of throwing ourselves at it, putting in every bit of money that we made on the compost lot, we would reinvest into equipment, the equipment that it takes to cut hay, to bale hay, to collect all of our own organic materials. And you can see on the right, we really, we started to learn how to do it a little bit better. Our windrows are properly shaped. We've got good covers on them. Um, they're laid out in a way that makes sense. Brian, next slide. And then, yeah, from that, um, we actually had an unfortunate event with our old um, compost lot. It actually caught on fire. There was a, like a random lightning strike that like burnt our business to the ground. Um, but with that came like new opportunity. Um, it was kind of that moment where this whole, this is a picture of our new lot. Um, the previous lot was maybe an eighth of an acre or something like that. And this new lot right here is actually at almost an acre entirely. Um, and it's given us the ability to actually produce enough compost where we're not like always trying to catch up, catch up, catch up with orders. Um, and so it's, it's funny, like, yeah, the, the, our original compost piles, I think were about 20 feet long. <laughs> um, and now actually all of our compost piles are about 180 feet. Um, and so, yeah, we can actually pack a lot more material into that space. Go ahead and next slide, Brian. So yeah, that was the goal when we started was food, like we wanted to get compost to table, right? We wanted to affect the food systems. We wanted to do something big. We never really wanted to be large scale compost producers, but that's kind of, if you, if you want to be in this industry, that's 
almost what you have to do at this point because there's just not a lot of availability on compost. And if you know our compost, it's expensive. So, you know, putting in that work and that time to make a really good product, um, it's difficult. And so now, you know, you saw that lot full of compost. Now we've actually brought this to farmers in our area. Um, we've been consulting for about a year now, maybe a little bit more. And that's really with consultation, that's the exciting time. You know, that's when you see your crops start to come in. You know, it's fall now. We've been treating since, you know, last fall. And, you know, now we're actually eating the food from the crops that we're helping grow. And um, these are crops that go to the grocery store. Um, they're the peppers that when you walk into Safeway, you just buy them off the shelf. Um, these, these peppers here, they're not even certified organic. They, I mean, they are organic and they're biologically focused, but they just go out to the public. And so when I eat these peppers and I taste this amazing flavor, like I know that we had a hand in putting some nutritious food on the table of people that we don't even know. So um, yeah, that's, it's an exciting start. Brian, next slide. Yeah, and this kind of it brings us into like our favorite parts of this job. Um, you know, like Keisha had mentioned, we never set out to be compost producers. It just kind of became that thing. But now we've gotten to a point where we can, that's kind of a little more automated system now. And we have other people that can do that work. So we actually get to go out to farms and actually put our consulting knowledge to work. And I don't know, I think like the, the best thing for me about consulting is like showing up to a place you've never been before, <clears throat> sitting down, like mapping it all out and just like doing detective work. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're entering a place and it's just like, you have to slowly piece together what has been happening in that area and what they've been doing to that land. So you can then start to try to convert them over or, you know, in the direction of having like a richer, healthier soil. And also my other favorite thing is is modifying equipment i don't know i like looking at a piece of machinery and like getting in there and like pulling it apart if i have to and actually like fixing everything to this kind of dialed in for biology um uh next slide yeah i would say like you know there's there's this step-by-step -step process it's not um, a lot of people call us and they think okay so how much compost is it going to take me to win this year um, and it's, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we do apply once and go, oh, wow, like this is really, really a, a big change. But often when we take our microscopes and we look in the soil, you know, after one application, you're not seeing those, the thriving ecosystems that you're hoping to see. You know, you've, you've seen a, a response to the plants, you know, maybe they're growing better than they ever have, but we can tell with the microscope that we haven't, you know, hit our limit yet. And so, you know, the, the previous slide is someone we've been, you know, who's just got started with this process. This slide is a client I'm super proud of. He's a strawberry farmer um, and he started this process far before he met us. He's been working on going organic, tilling in um, organic materials into his soil for probably three years and kind of haphazardly just, you know, putting out organic materials, tilling them in. But I want to point out on the slide, if you look right under those poppies, you can see that dark pile of soil and then look up at the road and above uh, above the property and you'll see that it's almost white all the soil in that valley no matter where you drive surrounding it in every single direction you look is that white dirt and his whole farm looks like that you know a beautiful dark soil and so you know coming into something like this and seeing someone who's put that effort of those flowers, they surround the entire farm. It's not just poppies. There's probably 60 different species of flowers, you know, all buzzing with pollinators and predators. And it is this like going farm to farm, seeing the different ways that people have worked out their problems and um, yeah, and investigating through the whole thing that makes it fun. But I would say like my favorite part about it is the food. I mean, look at those strawberries. They were insanely delicious. Um, and, and this guy as well, like he, he brought it up to us, like his profits, like all of his family spend their whole time worrying about their gardens and they grow strawberries as well. And he spends about half of his time just enjoying and studying the soil. And so, I mean, that's something that no matter what career you have, when you take on the soil food web approach, you're, you're giving yourself more free time away from stress to let the microbes do the work for you, you know, and we get to see this effect in the farmers and ourselves, we can trust in this process. And it's a job that we really enjoy. It's something that we're to the point now where we're not going, does this work? We're going, it does work. And if it's not working, we got to figure out what's wrong. And so, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to continue the journey and um, oh, I'm supposed to say something about profits. You know, at this point, we're finally making money, you guys. <laughs> do we enjoy an income? Yes, we do now. Now that we're consulting and selling compost and doing all of this work, um, 
hundred percent of our lives are funded by microbes and you know seeing where we come from yes we have a background in working with plants but we were not scientists before um I, you know i've never worked in large scale um agriculture. agriculture and casey was never driving trucks and tractors but he's incredible at backing a trailer now and he knows how to fix a tractor so um i guess the message is is that anyone can do this um and it is it's a really good job <laughs> next slide next slide oh yeah i think that's it for us great thanks casey i love the pictures <laughs> i love the the strawberry farm is impressive actually i, have to, so I have to go out there and take a look at it yep it's a good one Bring you some strawberries next summer. Hey, hey, that sounds great to me. I love strawberries. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. And now we're going to hear from Miles. So, Miles, you're going to talk about Terraforma. Yes, indeed I am. And I, I just want to start by prefacing all of this, that I am one half of this journey. Uh, my business partner, Cooper Scarborough, is the other half. And you will not hear from him today. So you're going to get kind of my side of, uh, of Terraforma and the journey that has been taken so far. Um, so we can go ahead and hop to the, the next slide here. Uh, so to give a little background about me and, and kind of how I arrived in the regenerative biological agricultural space, um, I went to school at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I have a bachelor's in neuroscience and upon graduating, you know, I, I had issues with working in a lab 24 uh, seven. I really wanted to find something that would allow me to be in nature, explore outside. Um, I have a really deep passion for health as well as as nature and just kind of doing right by our agricultural systems, ocean systems, uh, et cetera. Um, so I, that led me to a position at the Agricultural Commissioner's Office in Santa Cruz, uh, which was my initial introduction to agriculture, which is much more of a regulatory role, uh, um, you know, pest abatement, uh, pesticide controls, um, not really the position where you're helping to build soil health, you're more kind of fighting with farmers about what they can do and why. So, um, you know, kind of getting that start and that exposure to the chemical side of agriculture uh, was a really good awakening to wanting to look for something different um, and really wanting to see if there are ways to help farmers uh, kind of get around the use of these heavily restricted and, and damaging chemical options that they had available and look for something better. So. Uh, that is what led me towards the uh, Soil Food Web, um, started working on some projects in a startup, and then shortly uh, afterwards ended up starting uh, Terraforma with Cooper. So we can go ahead and hop to the next slide here. Um, so again, kind of touching on what inspired me to become a soil health expert in this way. Um, I had an innate interest in sustainability and, and trying to make a positive impact in food systems, um, trying to create healthier food sources where, you know, people aren't necessarily in constant need of medical attention all the time or having medical issues based off of just eating bad food, essentially, um, as well as figuring out ways to lower our impact on the environment. Um, you know, how can we actually make a tangible change at a large scale at the greater conventional agricultural level? Um, you know, when you first get exposed to this field, especially the biological side of things, you realize it's largely unexplored. Um, we only really know about 10% of the organisms that live in the soil. Uh, and we've only really started taking a really heavy scrutinous look at this, um, aside from Elaine, for the past like five, 10 years. Um, so most of the organisms that we're aware of, anything you see on a shelf in a bottle, that's usually discovered through the medical field, um, through medical applications, and then, you know, they pull it from the soil, so you kind of get a sense of the, the soil activity and, like, what benefit it has there, but there are millions of uh, unknown organisms with beneficial effects um, and the capacity to provide more to soil once you start returning those organisms to the soil as well. Um, there's also an expansion in technological innovation. Uh, that's something that at Terraforma we're really passionate about, combining newer technology with more holistic regenerative methodology in order to get the best of both worlds. Um, it's something that, for me, I really see the union of better regenerative practices and using things like drones, better soil analytics, um, different low compaction application methodologies that allow us to open up new opportunities in the agricultural space that did not exist in the past. Uh, and then, of course, there's lots of opportunity. There are hundreds of millions of farms across the world. Um, and to be able to, to work with these different growers and introduce them to new concepts and ideas 
um, is, you know, there's an overabundance of, of that opportunity out there. Um, next slide. So one of the things that we, we want to talk about is sort of what our life looks like now. So in terms of what I do on a day to day, uh, it's a little bit of everything. Uh, something that I think you'll see run as a trend through all, all of these presentations is that we all run our own businesses. Um, we all are responsible for, you know, marketing, consultation, um, you know, the P&L, really understanding how do I run this business? How do I make a profit on this business? Uh, it's something that all of us have to do. And so it's, it's a lot of, it's definitely a lot of work. It's not just necessarily, I'm going to talk about agriculture here. There is sort of that hidden background that also has to get done with registering your business, handling marketing, working through education with different farmers, um, going through different soil analytics. Um, so I do a lot of traveling. Uh, we have a lot of clients out of the country. So, you know, it's a lot of interacting with clients, getting on site, evaluating conditions, understanding what the farmers would like to do with their piece of property, um, understanding their mindset and mentality, doing some education with those farmers and their team members to make sure that everybody kind of understands uh, where and like why we're doing what we're doing and what those end goals are. And then continued consultation, sort of reporting structures on the back end of that. Uh, to make sure that we can follow up with those items. So it really is a mix of project management, like research and development, really pouring a lot into making our processes more effective, you know, our, our products better um, and our systems uh, much more efficient. And then, um, you know, we also, obviously my personal days, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, you know, I think everybody's going to have a variable amount of what work looks like, um, but I do work probably a good 60 plus hours a week. Um, this year I traveled about hundred days of the year. So I've been on the road quite a lot. This past two months has been probably been home about two weeks. Um, a lot of calls with clients, a lot of work with, with labs and staying in touch with those labs. Um, a lot of work on sales and meeting new clients, kind of walking them through, you know, what is soil microbiology? Why is this important? Um, a lot of people have a baseline awareness at this point, but really, you know, giving them a deeper understanding and explaining how we might be able to help is a big piece of that process. Um, you know, there's a lot of reporting structures. So working with clients, you need to constantly update them on how progress is going, work with them on different um, action items and practices that are going to help them make improvements in their fields, um, help them interpret all of the results that you're seeing in the soil from a biological perspective. Um, and then, of course, corporate meetings and management. So working with the executive team, making sure the business is still running, um, all of that takes up quite a lot of time as well. Um, so, you know, I think different people can structure their time differently uh, than how I've structured it specifically, you know, hopefully in time, uh, I won't be working 60 plus hours a week, I'll be able to work a little bit less. Uh, but you know, you, you kind of have to go with the ebb and flow uh, of where work takes you. So um, you'll see on the right, these are just a couple examples of different pictures of things that I've done in the past five years. Um, you know, we've done a lot of research and development, you'll see kind of those little yellow sticky papers, which are um, trying to understand spray patterns, uh, lots of soil sampling, um, a lot of educational and meetings uh, across the world. And then that bottom picture is just me gearing up to fly around. So <laughs> a lot of a lot of different uh, diversity of options there. Uh, next slide, please. So our future goals are to continue to build a company that helps people lead healthier lives through regenerative innovation. So, you know, we're not trying to necessarily limit ourselves to um, too narrow a scope. We really want to see solutions to real world problems that have an impact on the way people are able to live their lives and an impact on the environment in general. Um, so, you know, right now, agriculture is a huge focus for that for us, reducing chemical usage, creating healthier food, um, and creating better conditions for workers. Um, you know, these chemicals can have a really negative impact on everybody who works in the fields, um, it can be very toxic. And then that goes all the way through our food, food supply. Um, and that's something that I would really like to see uh, improved. So that's part of where we see ourselves moving forward is to continue to make a larger impact and hopefully include other areas of regenerative innovation under that fold that can improve people's lives. Um, next slide. Um, so how I feel about what I do, it's definitely very high stress, high reward. Um, every time you have a very successful implementation, you see a really strong result from something that you've helped implement. Um, that's an amazing feeling. <laughs> um, it's very, it's very helpful. Um, but you know, it's also very high stress because what you do doesn't always work right away. It's a lot of iterative learning. 
Um, you'll try things, you'll work with clients to try to implement certain practices. And if it doesn't work the first time, you have to come back to the drawing board and try again. So it's a lot of learning. And, you know, if you're working with clients that are putting their trust into you, it's also a lot of responsibility to want to drive them forward and really give them that good result. Um, so, you know, I think the people that do best in this industry are the people that really care about their clients and want to give them the best result possible. Um, so naturally there's a certain degree of, of stress and pressure that comes alongside that to, to deliver for all of those clients. Um, it is certainly a challenging job. Uh, every morning I wake up to about 20 new problems. Um, so, you know, if you, if you enjoy a challenge, it is certainly a, uh, a definite, it's certainly a good opportunity for you. Um, it's something where, you know, it, it's a diversity of issues from running a business, working within different soil ecosystems, working within different cropping systems, um, getting access to the different raw materials you might need to make compost, uh, to make different products and supply. Um, you know, we've done a lot of innovation into our own process, um, and learning to kind of build our own bioreactor systems, work through the electronics, all that sort of stuff is also just mounting challenges that we constantly troubleshoot. Um, but most importantly, it's uh, an impassioned project. I'm very passionate about what we do. Um, and so it's something that keeps me driven to always excel to do better. Um, this is just a picture of, of me working away in the garage, kind of putting together different systems, running different tests, running different R&D on how to optimize those systems, uh, get the most biology out of each of those um, systems that we're running. And then this picture on the right, I think, is a good example of showing me being both happy and extremely tired. Um, <laughs> uh, you can see the growth speed there, not sleeping a lot, but um, having a great time uh, doing what I do. Uh, next slide. Um, so the best thing about my job is definitely finding solutions to complex problems. Uh, it's something that you'll have to do with any farm. Every farmer goes through this process and being a resource for those farmers gives you a piece of that puzzle. So uh, it's constantly finding unique and different solutions for different problems that'll pop up uh, across every single project. Um, the side of building relationships with people is uh is fantastic I, I really like connecting with people especially from different cultures so i've had the opportunity to build a lot of long-term friendships um, meet a lot of people with different perspectives and that's something that personally i value quite a lot about the work that i do um, i also enjoy traveling uh, you know the travel i do is not very touristic i'm not spending a lot of time outside of farms uh, it's very rural very involved with the people that i work with um, but I actually quite enjoy that. It gives you a look at a country that you normally wouldn't be able to have a look at. So being able to work within a space or within a country where uh, normally you would never be able to work. Um, so I really enjoy that component of it. And then there's constant learning and improvement. Uh, this really is a job where you are your own limitation. So you need to be able to sit down and do your own research, solve your own problems. And really you are the one driving the entire process. So you are going to either constantly learn uh, or it's going to be a difficult job to effectively execute. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of satisfaction, um, you know, for me, I'm very gratified by what I do, uh, but I find it difficult to have an encompassing uh, satisfaction across the board with everything that I've done just because I want to do so much more. Um, you know, every, every time we hit a milestone or an achievement, it's, we, we have yet to kind of like pop champagne and have a party. We're always kind of like, hey, that was great, but we've got to do this. Um, so, you know, part of that constant drive to improve is kind of limits the amount of like pure satisfaction you get of a job well done because there's always something more. Uh, but it's also a piece of what has allowed us to be effective in this space is never, stop, never hitting the brakes. Um, we're constantly striving for more. Uh, and that is something that has helped us a lot to grow quickly to learn very rapidly and to help people achieve their goals. Um, next slide. So in terms of a work-life balance, like I mentioned, I, I work quite a lot. Um, again, in, in this position, you are the one responsible for everything. You know, if, if you can't draw on clients, um, that kind of falls on your lap. It's up to you to pay your own bills, pay your employees, um, make sure everything works. So, you know, on the one hand, you you are a bit uh, you are a bit beholden to your clients, right? Um, in this position, so as you take on more work, if you really want your clients to succeed, 
Uh, it's not as though you necessarily have the freedom to do whatever you want because you do want to be there for your clients, open up that space and time for your clients. So, you know, I think there's flexibility in how different people work those schedules. Um, certainly the path uh, that Cooper and I have taken uh, is, is a very intensive path where we're trying to look towards the future. Um, we're trying to put a lot of work into the company, bring on more people, train them. It's a lot of facets and we're very directly connected to all of those different uh, pieces of the puzzle. Um, so we hold a lot of a lot of responsibility and we're very dedicated to pushing things forward and making it work, um, which is where we have this really heavy work schedule, right? Um, again, I'm not as a peer consultant, as doing microscope work, you might have slightly different flexibility. Um, but, you know, I do work most weekends. I do travel months at a time. Um, we are working really long hours. And you can see a picture down here. This is Cooper and myself <laughs> kind of having a little free time at the end of a, a work meeting. Um, we can go ahead and jump to the next slide here. So in terms of joining the movement, um, you know, there really is no set path. When you come out the end of this, it's, it's up to you where you want to take it. You can start a compost facility um, like, like Keisha did. You can, you know, go ahead and, and look into consultation. You can start a microscope lab. Um, you can really take it any direction. You want to take it off of that springboard of knowledge that you've been given. Um, you know, it really is uh, something that's like getting a college level course, right? You have a lot of knowledge. Um, you have some experience from the hands-on portion of that course, but you really need to build that experience once you get out into the field. Um, so there's a lot of adapting and learning on your own. There's a process of trying you know, maybe it worked, maybe you fail, but then learning from that and pushing forward. Uh, and so, you know, one of the one of the tags I would definitely put on there is don't expect instant success coming out of this. The, the Soil Food Web gives a lot of resources. They have a really great support network. So being able to talk to people that have gone through some of the things you're going to go through, um, being able to get some clients through the Soil Food Web to get you started. Um, all of those things are great tools and resources that a lot of, you know, a lot of other uh, potential like crash courses through, you know, programming, something like that might not have available. Um, but, you know, it is a learning process. You are going to have to go out there and, and do the hard work to get to be in a place where you can find those great results. Um, and then definitely be passionate. There, there are better ways uh, to make money, um, I would say, most likely. Um, you have to be really wanting to make a difference in people's soil. Um, you know, it does take uh, a number of years. It took a number of years for us to get to a point where we were making a substantial profit. Um, or a profit that's livable. Um, and so it is a struggle to get to the place uh, where you go from, okay, I'm brand new at this to, okay, I'm making a, a reasonable living. Um, and so to get through that period, it definitely helps to have a passion for what you're trying to do. Um, and it definitely helps to want to make that difference. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, that looks like the, the end of the presentation there. Perfect. Great, thanks, Miles. Um, and a lot of questions coming in, so I'm sure we'll be able to tackle some of the specific questions that have been popping in the Q&A once we get to that spot. Okay, we're going to now pivot from Miles to Alan. So, Alan, take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good morning, as the case may be. Um, yeah, I'm Alan Skinner, with owner of Soil Life Organics, uh, based in Jacksonville, Florida. And there's my contact information if you have any specific questions we can talk about. Um, and... Um, uh, I have, I, you might want to go to the next slide. Um, my background is kind of circuitous. And I think it's interesting when you listen to these other consultants, how you start from just about anywhere in your life. I'm actually started in this career, probably in the midpoint of my life, more later than, than earlier. Uh, but the skill set that I had prior to me getting involved with the biology, soil biology, uh, really supported and, and gave me a lot of uh, background to what I was doing. I went to University of Florida, did mechanical engineering for 20 years, which gave me a good solid science and a project management background. I, I pivoted into real estate based on some family assets. And that's a, a picture of our civil culture operation in Florida. And, um, and then I decided, decided uh, smart, either smartly or stupidly, I decided to stay in real estate around 2005. And those of you who know what happened in 2007 knew that we had a huge um, great recession, as they call it, and crashed the real estate industry, especially in hit, hard hit in Florida. So my great dreams of staying in real estate crashed pretty bad. But I was working with a firm, a uh, land planning firm, uh, that my boss was actually, uh, his father-in-law was a microbiologist for the oil companies. And um, my, my 
my boss, who was the son-in-law, said, hey, you should really start looking into doing research on soil biology because that's that's the, really the future of how things are going to be grown. And we might be able to save fertilizer and reduce retention pond sizes and all kind of stuff. And so anyway, long story short, um, we got involved with a business where we started to sell some of these uh, microbial products like Sumagro and Quantigro. Some of you may have heard of those products. And we had a license to sell those in Florida, north, mostly North Florida, where it's real sandy soils with low organic matter. And um, after doing this for about two or three years, I, I wasn't getting any good results from these products. And the clients were great clients. I mean, the farmers were saying, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, try these products out. If they work, I'll buy them. But they got to they gotta work, you know. And so I found out about Dr. Ingham. And I said, uh, Dr. Ingham, why do these things not work? What's going on? And she goes, well, what's in them? And I said, well bacteria and maybe a little bit of trichoderma fungi, but that's about it. And she goes, well, you need to have the whole soil food web, which is all the complete ecosystem, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes to have nutrient cycling, which releases nutrients. So I said, oh, huh, well, that, that was great time of my life spent. But she says, if you want to learn more about this, I offer this course. And so I started around 2016, I started to uh, take her courses and I know it's, I've got my certification now in 2022, and you may wonder why it took so long. Well, when I chose my final project uh, to, to achieve my soil food web certification, um, I got, uh, the timing was pretty good because I asked to, to pursue a NRCS conservation innovation grant in Jacksonville, Florida at a small urban farm called White Harvest Farm. And um, we, were, we won the grant. And I basically, I wrote the grant and I wrote it around Dr. Ingham's methods. So I got to literally do uh, hard work testing her methods out for three years on an urban farm and really sharpen my skills and in terms of like not only doing microscope work but doing making compost and making extracts and compost teas and, and that kind of thing. So that's uh, kind of my background. Uh, next slide please. Um, yeah what's the inspiration? Um, it was kind of interesting how teaming with microbes was mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I really got a good background believe it or not with that early years working as uh, microbial inoculants because at least, at least the people that were, were, were supporting me through the manufacturer were very knowledgeable and got me, I got in front of a lot of really, really smart people, which was great. Um, I have a, I have a um, great love and care for the environment. I kind of, you know, I grew up with, with land in our family. And also uh, my dad had a big love for native plants and uh, gardening and things like that. Um, and this career really suits my, my background love of learning and science and things like that. So it's, it's a great, great match. Um, next slide, please. So what's my current life look like? Um, well, again, a little, little older than maybe the average uh, soil food web person, but I've got three sectors in my life. One is doing the consulting, which I really love. And it's a way to make money at knowledge with having a certain amount of knowledge. Um, and so that's, that's been really good. I'll talk a little more about that. Um, I do, I luckily, um, I'm still using the farm, White Harvest Farms in Jacksonville as kind of my staging place for my business, but I offer a lot of kind of free consulting to the farm. So I kind of, it's kind of a win-win thing. Um, and I, it's funny because working at the farm allows me to do a lot of um, experimentation with um, trying different things out on, on, on different crops and, and maybe methodology, different extract systems. Uh, that a lot of, I could talk all afternoon about that, but I won't have time for that. I'm also semi-retired, so I, I'm actually spending a big chunk of my life uh, traveling with my wife and doing things like that. Most of my business is consulting with you know, farmers and urban, garden, urban gardeners and landscape businesses. Um, my Kind of my superpower right now is doing a full nutrient management program. My, my favorite client is one that asked me to come to their site, and I'll do a full physical assessment with penetrometers, measuring compaction. My, the best tool I think I've ever bought believe it or not, is a hand auger because you dig down three, four feet and you see what the soil profile looks like. And most people never do that. And you learn more about that almost than anything else. I also do a mineral analysis and I do a, and then, then I do the biological analysis and then I write a complete cookbook on how to fix everything. And I get paid to do that. Um, I also uh, am able to make a certain amount of small biocomplete compost where I can then implement solutions. Like on the left, that picture right there is a client that there's a house on the river that spent $200,000 on landscaping, and they wanted me to inoculate all their plantings to, to ensure that they were launched properly you know, as they went forward growing. I also love to speak about uh, soil biology because it's very important on a lot of levels. 
Um, it's a great career. It's uh, we need more people like us uh, to do this. Um, and it might just save our planet as well. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that's another picture. That's the farm on the left. That's the, um, the White Harvest Farm. And, and you know, you'll notice that um, the, 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 no, the term no-till is very important because no-till uh, means that you've got to keep that underground ecosystem in an undisturbed state to be able to sustain the microbes so they will do their thing. Um, if you keep tilling it, you'll never achieve that. So we're trying to become, a, we're really a no-till uh, urban farm. On the right is an example of, I offer workshops on how to make compost. Um, and so uh, that's a lot of fun. You get to meet a lot of neat people. Next slide. Uh, my future career goals is to continue doing what I'm doing. Again, it's just great. It's fun. Uh, kind of like Casey, you, you get to kind of fiddle around with equipment. That, that system on the left you see there is my little, you know, barnyard invention. And I'm probably going to put a, a, an open source explanation on how to do it. But basically, I'm able to make um, extract with a 250 gallon tote and, and uh, use a little pump from a uh, trash pump from tractor supply and I can spray up that, that system actually was able to spray like a 120 foot diameter circle with a, with a fire hose of extract. So it's just, and it didn't cost me more than about $750 to build that. Um, but I also, I like to consult mainly with small, medium sized farmers, mainly because like they're, they're short and kind of getting get out kind of projects. I, um, bigger, I would like a bigger client, but sometimes they'll suck up all your time and resources. Um, I also consult with uh, small and build urban farms. I just purchased, a, for those of you who know what a BCS tractor is, it's a little two-wheel tractor. I've got all the implements. So now I'm able to actually do a design build for small farms for permaculture operations. Um, my goal is to scale up my biocomplete compost production. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be like Casey and Keisha <laughs> and, make, and make the stuff that they make. Um, I like to mentor others. We're in the process of hiring somebody at the farm who will do what I do, but unless, you know, as an assistant and also educate people about, about the, um, what we do here uh, in the world of soil biology. Next slide. And here's the picture. Look, obviously, next left, upper left is a microscope assessment showing some really good fungi. Lower left is education. And then it, on the right is a, is a client who had just bare soil and then we're trying to get some soil biology growing with some cover a cover crop mix. Next slide. The passion, you know, it's like anything else. Um, love what I really love what I do. You know, it's, it's I love kind of love everything I've done in my life. Um, I don't know what it is about the world of soil biology, but it's just, it's once you latch onto something that you, it's uh, that you just want to learn about there, there's just, it's un, it's an unfolding business. So there's a, it's a circuit. It, you're always learning about something new, whether pod, there's so many podcasts, there's so many books, there's, YouTube videos, et cetera. It's like, just can't get enough of it. It's really fun. Once you get, once you get good at this and you develop microscope skills, you can start doing your own little research and really doing some cool stuff. Um, I'm, I'm in, been trying to really get my compost to enhance and become even better. And I've come up with some great little techniques to do that. I, I love helping others. Um, if, if you're turned on by seeing a smile on people's faces, it's, that's kind of my passion. And at the end of the day, it also helps the planet. So I like to say it's a win, win, win. It's a win for you because you're a consultant making some money. It's a win for the client because you're helping them. And it's a win for the planet. So it's a really triple win. I mean, how often, how often do you get to do all three of those at once? It's a, it's a great. So uh, next slide. Uh, the business. Um, the business side, again, is interesting. It's, um, it, 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 and because of my background, I've done, I've done a lot. I've, been lucky to have the background I've had because I've done a lot of sales. I've done a lot of, uh, you know, when I worked for that, when I was selling my microbial inoculants door to door to farmers in North Florida, I got, I kind of honed my sales skills. And I also made a lot of connections with farmers and well, as well as um, key advocates for what I'm doing. So I get some referrals through them, but, um, but I like to, to please people and make them happy with, with giving them over the top services. You know, luckily for me, um, it's, you know, being in my, in my life is, it's kind of a supplemental income. It's not really my main source of income, which is kind of nice. Um, so, um, you know, that it's, you know, it's really interesting. It's to hear everybody's journey and how they got to where they are with this business, but you can start anywhere, uh, in, in your life with this career. Um, but obviously, obviously if you're starting out really young, like right out of college, you've got so many things you've got to learn. So it may be tough to make a living right out, of, right out, but don't ever give up. And you might need some supplemental income. You might have a, a second job. 
to, to do support you as you go through the soil food web journey. Um, I gave some examples. Uh, one example might be is, is if you can find somebody who's making co biocomplete compost, you can also assist them as being an outside salesperson to do consulting or biology applications, or maybe give workshops, or maybe even work for a large scale farm, like a maybe even an industrial chemical farm that wants to go biological and you can be their in-house biological person that um, do that. So there's ways to make a full, you could make a full uh, time job at this, but you might have to be a little creative about how you do it. Um, having equipment helps. Just like Keisha was saying, she kept reinvesting in the business. Well, that's what, that's all I've been doing lately. But um, now I've got a lot of great stuff, you know, and, and I don't have to buy any more. So it's really nice. Um, fees you'll get vary by your client. Um, some clients will pay you what, what you think you really deserve, given the, the amount of investment you've made in your education. Um, but I had a client recently who I gave him my fee and he says, oh, that's a little way more than I said. Well, you know, I said, well, you know what? I'll give you my my 2021 fee rate, which is less. And uh, my it was more important to me to get the word out and have a successful bio, biological um, su a client, the client that was that could see the value of biology than it was necessarily for my income because this is we're in the infancy of this industry and I want to have a good name for what we're doing and make sure that people see it. And so he was very, very happy that I was able to work that out. And I still made some good money. So it wasn't so, it's so bad. Um, and lastly, the one thing that I do want to point out to, to those that listening to the webinar is that um, in terms of the demand for this, this, this uh, business, I mean, we're in a crisis mode now with our planet. It's going to get even worse as time goes on. And so there's good, there's lots of wake up calls being fired off left and right, but it's going to be a huge wake up call if we don't do something soon. And so I think this industry is only gonna grow. And so I think it's a pretty good career path to pursue. Um, next slide. So anyway, in summary, if you, um, if you have an affinity for science and a love of learning, it's a great career because you, you will be, it's a lot of, um, it's a challenging career. I, Dr., I love Dr. Ingham's method, methods of education because she teaches you 80% of what you need to know. The last 20% is stuff you've got to figure out for your geographical area because making compost in, in California is different than making cal uh, compost in Florida. And the fungi may work differently in different parts of the country. You've got to find out what works for you. And, you're, and, and we, we have an international crowd. God knows what it's like to make compost from in the Caribbean all the way to, to um, you know, Sweden. Um, you must listen to your clients and, and for, it's most important to listen to your clients and find out what they need. Usually they're motivated uh, first by finances because they, they're in a business and you've got to prove to them that, that you can save them money. Um, but then we love the environment. The environment is secondary uh, to clients. They, they want you to make them more money. And then they, if the environment improves, then all the, all the better. Um, and I can't remember, I can't see my last one, it's being blocked. But anyway, it's, uh, I think though that it's a great career path, um, you know, given the fact that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge demand for it. So uh, that's, uh, that's my story. Well, thanks, Miles. Okay, um, we're gonna move on to myself and I'll be the last presentation before we move into our promotion uh, video and also get to Q&A. So a little bit about my soil food web journey. Um, I own a company called Sprouting Soil, and then also, like I said, we were creating a new company called Soil Matters. Um, but really, kind of how I started, it seems very similar to a lot of folks. I'm going to have to throw in the Teaming with Microbes from Jeff Lowenfels, because that was a very inspirational book for me as well. Um, and I think a lot of people who have read that book and read the forward that Elaine wrote, um, at least for me, it connected a whole bunch of dots and really kind of steered me into this direction. So I'm very blessed that I was able to read that book and then read the forward from Elaine. But but really, when it, it kind of comes down to the nuts and bolts of how we started, uh, my wife and I had a five-acre homestead in Northern California. Um, and a little bit about my background, I did grow up on a homestead. Um, you know, my parents, we raised animals, and we had vegetable gardens and fruit trees and berry plants and, and all that kind of stuff. We actually raised quite a bit of food for ourselves. But what's very interesting about that is that my parents were very conventional um, in their methodology. So we, we tilled the soil, we put, used fertilizers, we used herbicides, pesticides, and yada, yada, yada. 
And so um, that was what I brought to the homestead that my wife and I bought, uh, brought, or bought um, that I was very conventional in our approach. And I was really unhappy with the way that the garden was turning out. That first year was the best garden I had when we were doing conventional. And every year subsequent to that, uh, it was more disease, more pest pressures, more inputs were needed. And it became kind of drudgery, so much work and so many failures and things like that. And um, it was kind of funny, as, you know, Keisha was mentioning permaculture was our first, you know, dipping the toe into this, this route. It was the same for me as well. I thought, okay, there's got to be a better way. And I started really looking at permaculture as a design science and started implementing those things on the homestead and seeing significant changes. But, you know, permaculture is great. Design science, I kind of understood the design, but I still didn't understand the why. Why were the plants responding so much better? Why was I getting less disease and pest pressures? And that's when I, I started to get, you know, with Jeff Lonefell's book and then looking at uh, some videos of Elaine talking about the soil food web. And then eventually, um, you know, I took uh, classes from Elaine to really kind of get that deep dive into the soil food web. And so many dots at that point got connected for me. I really started understanding, you know, how the, the relationship between the microbes in the soil and the plants, um, how that was such a wonderful way to grow plants um, and it just really you know our, our homesteading was always a passion and then homesteading turned into an obsession um, and really that obsession led to us you know changing our careers um, so inspirations um, really our, the homestead that we lived on was a massive inspiration for us uh, just seeing some of the changes that we were making and seeing how the ecosystem really responded and not just about the the plants growing themselves you know seeing oh wow wonderful gardens and I, i'm starting to see these very healthy disease resistant plants and the pest pressures have gone down it was the other parts of the ecosystem that really came into the homestead as well the amount of amphibians you know frogs and salamanders really increased the reptiles, the the birds, the amount of different types of birds that really started to visit our property. And then all the different types of insects, you know, from parasitic wasps to lace wings to prey mantises. It, it just, it seemed like the, the homestead exploded in life, um, which was really kind of a an internalized feeling I had was I'm really on the right path. It, it, it kind of felt like, yes, nature's really kind of finding a home here in this homestead because of the changes that we made. Um, and then, you know, when I was able to connect these different dots and, and really my understanding became more in depth and in kind of in tune with what we were doing, uh, the more I wanted to learn the more I really wanted to understand about how the soil food web worked. And, and again, that passion turned into obsession, which, which really allowed my wife and I to make a big career change. Um, we were both working in the high tech industry. Um, you know, I was a computer science major and I had worked decades in the high tech computer industry, but it was becoming very commoditized. I was becoming very unhappy with the direction that was going. And so the homestead was something that was like, okay, I really feel in tune with this. And we made a big life change and said, you know what, we're going to become soul food web consultants and actually share this knowledge uh, with our clients and it really help them uh, connect those dots and make those changes on their farms, their, their residential yards, the market gardens and so forth. Okay, so, um, you know, it was a big life decision. You know, it's, it's hard to leave an industry that you've been working at for, for quite some time. And, you know, we had great salaries, good benefits, and all that other kind of stuff. And it's scary to, to go out there and, and create your own business. But you know what? We felt so passionate about what we were doing and felt like, you know, we really can make some significant changes. Um, so we said, yeah, we're going to make this, uh, this, this leap. And... I kind of transitioned as a part-time uh, running my own business while still working full-time in my corporate life. And it was, you know, a tough couple of years because, you know, I'm running a homestead, trying to grow our own food, running now a part-time business and then still working full-time. But, you know, it's still, even though those were some tough years as far as a lot, a lot of work, um, the passion of what we were doing carried me through that. You know, I still felt like I was highly motivated and I could deal with the the long hours and, and so forth. Um, and then 
really, you know, when I started the business, the way I, I started to get clients was going out and speaking at local grower groups. And, I, you know, probably where you live, there's going to be where groups of people get together to talk about the farming or the agriculture or the landscaping that they do. And so I would reach out to, you know, the county extension office and find out where the wine growers are, are meeting and, you know, where the orchard growers are meeting and just sending them emails and saying, you know what, um, I have some knowledge to share. Do you mind if I show up to one of your meetings and talk about soil biology? It could be a 15 minute long presentation all the way up to an hour. And there was a lot of receptiveness. Um, those groups were very interested in understanding what I had to say. And I really think it's because, you know, soil health and soil biology is really becoming part of the zeitgeist that, you know, there's a, enough interest or exposure about um, how soil biology and soil health is really the, 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 the future of, of agriculture or really the future of growing systems that they wanted to hear about it. And, uh, you know, all they heard was really headlines. They really didn't have much more uh, in-depth knowledge, at least most people didn't. And so having uh, been able to give a talk of, about the role of the soil food web and soil biology, uh, there's a lot of receptiveness uh, from that. And I, I got a number of clients uh, just because they, they heard the talk and said, you know what, that's the direction we want to go. We want you to come out and help us do make that change. And, and so my business did grow kind of organically in that sense. And then, you know, where am I at today? Um, I would say my business is thriving. You know, I've, I'm constantly getting new client interactions. Uh, people want uh, to use our services. And uh, I'm very generalist in my, um, in my business. I, I have clients that are residential yards, uh, homesteads, uh, small scale market gardens, all the way up to very, very large scale agriculture in both nut crops and annuals and you know vineyards and so forth um i also have landscaping companies um which is you know amazing to me you think landscaping would be one of those ones that you know would be kind of lower in the list but there's a lot of landscaping companies especially in california that are concerned about water retention and it, what can they do to make sure that they can maintain their landscapes with a, a very reduced water profile that they're getting access to um, and then also compost producers, you know, uh, Keisha was mentioning that, uh, you know, one of the big challenges that we run into, you know, for doing the work that we do is that there's not very many compost producers that create a biologically complete compost, you know, compost that has those necessary organisms. And, and so working with these compost producers to start making a much better biological uh, compost uh, is very, very important. And I think there's a significant interest in the, the, the commercial compost uh, production to start to make that change. Uh, and one thing I didn't put up here as well is um, starting to also do a lot of ecosystem restoration uh, work. So where we have, uh, especially in California, in, in Nevada and Oregon, where we have a lot of fires that come through, uh, being able to try to restore those lands. Um, and and it's, 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 you know, Big acreage, but it, it's it's very very rewarding work to be able to try to make the, those ecosystem changes. And at this point, I really haven't had to do much marketing. Um, I'm really kind of a stage now where I get a, a lot of word of mouth um, type of of client interactions, where you know a farmer is making big changes. They talk to other farmers. That farmer wants to know, and so then they get referred to me and that type of thing. Um, in the one area that I, I do get marketed is through the SoFo of school. So, you know, I have my, my, um, you know, my company and my name posted on the consultants page and that works out really well. I've had actually quite a few clients, uh, reach out to me or find me, uh, through that avenue as well. Um, and then we made a big life change. You know, that homestead that I was talking to you about, you know, my wife and I had that for 20 years and we made significant um you know changes to our homestead and really had a, a very functioning ecosystem um but i was doing a lot more travel and a lot more work that was kind of keeping me away from the homestead and um the homestead was of a size that my wife was like hey this is really hard for me to try to manage as well while you're, you're gone so we made a big life change and we moved to oregon and in fact we, we moved to the central coast of oregon which is a very different climate from where i was living in northern california um, and which is great. Uh, it, it's allowing me to look at the different growing systems in a much different climate and, um, and then also trying to build my business up here in Oregon. Um, I find that the work is really fulfilling. Um, 
you know, Miles was, was kind of mentioning that, you know, it's hard work and can be long hours, that type of thing. But really at the end of the day, there's nothing better than, than seeing the changes at your client's location and knowing that you're making a big impact, you know, not only to the quality of the food that they're producing or the growing systems that they have, but in the lives of those farmers um, or the people that are, are, are you know, growing, it, it's, you know, be able to see some of the de-stressing from their standpoint, where the, the organisms start to take over, start to do that nutrient cycling, you know, more disease suppression, better pest uh, control, and those types of things. That makes life easier for farmers. And um, you know, I do make a living at the work that I do. Um, you know, it, it's it's one of those things like uh, I think Alan was bringing up about, and and uh, I think Casey was bringing up too that you know. There's some the capital cost that is early on. You know, I had to buy a spray rig and get my microscopes and some of the equipment and things like that. So early on, you know, you have some of those costs that are going to, you know, not allow you to really make a good profit in the very beginning. But um, over time, for sure, you know, once those capital investments kind of get paid for through the company, um, then then that's when you really start to 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 see the the, the rewards coming in. Um, and then there's also the seasonality to the work that I do. Uh, for me, it, it's a lot of my clients don't want to talk to me in August and September. They're doing harvest and, you know, they're very busy in doing that kind of work. So I get kind of slow in that, that period of time frame. And then in December and January is my slower months as well. Not that I don't have any business. I mean, there's still different uh, types of growing systems and, and research things that we're doing and helping clients that, that way. But um, it gets very busy in the spring, summer and uh, in fall time frame. Okay, so what's the future? Um, so one of the exciting parts about the future for us is expanding the consultancy business, you know, combining forces with uh, Keisha and Casey to really allow for us to, to grow into much larger scale types of projects and, and be able to run a lot of large scale projects at, at, at that time frame. And, you know, one of the goals we're looking for is to also then train new consultants. You know, um, Alan was kind of mentioning that, I think, as far as when you come into it, you know, you have about 80% of the knowledge that you need, and there's that last 20 that you really got to be able to figure out all the different nuances about different growing systems and how to work with farmers and that type of thing. Um, and so I, we want to be able to, to bring in new consultants and, and train them, you know, kind of an apprenticeship type of, of format and uh, you know allow them to cut their teeth on projects while having some guidance from people that have been out there you know doing that work um, and like i said we want to take on a lot more large-scale projects you know it, it, there's you know i was reading some you know conversation in the chat talking about you know what about small scale you know that's important it, and it absolutely absolutely is um, but large scales where we're going to make i think some significant changes especially around climate impacts and those types of things so it's important to be able to do both small scale as also as large scale projects. And, you know, really want to hone the practices that we do so that we can make it easier for our clients to transition. You know, where you really, I think, um, make a, a tremendous impact as a consultant is in the transition period. How do you transition them from their current farming practices, which is typically going to be agrochemical, or kind of traditional organic into biological farming, and and how do you make that transition so they can still maintain profitability, that they can you know still you know have an operating farm, um, but also make sure that you're weaning them off of their current practices that are harming the soil biology, and, and that is really I think where we make um, the, the biggest impact, and then also research you know. It, it this um, you know understanding the soil food web and soil the role of soil biology it feels to me like we're kind of at the tip of the iceberg that there's still so much more to learn and there's so much more research that needs to be done uh, to be able to to really figure out how we can hone some of these practices to make it easier and better for farms to make that transition and I definitely want to be part of that research that's going to shape that industry. And then, you know, giving advice to others, you know, people that, that are thinking about becoming consultants. Um, so one, I would say, is really try to join or build a community of like-minded people in your area. Um, when I was living down in Northern California, um, we had a really strong group of folks that were passionate about soil food web and the soil biology. And it was just a really 
empowering aspect of being able to get together, have conversations, share experiences, share stories, and share knowledge. And so building a community around you um, is, I think, a really important uh, thing to do. Um, and then other thing, you know, I, I get this question a lot from people who are thinking about becoming consultants, which is uh, they're afraid of the competition. You know, well, what if I become a consultant then I have to compete with you? And I, I kind of look at it, it this way, that we are in an emerging market, that the opportunity space that's out there is so much larger than the actual people, the needed people to be able to do this work, um, that competition is not an issue. Um, and in fact, co uh, you know, cooperation um, is a really important thing. The, there are many times when I will forward off clients or business to other of my colleagues because I don't have the time, maybe the skills, um, and I feel really good about doing that. Um, I don't feel bad like, oh, wow, I'm giving my competitor an edge over me. Um, there's just too much work and, and too much opportunity space for that to be an issue. Um, and also one thing you know that you have to learn early on is make sure you don't oversell yourself. Um, and really kind of find where your comfort zone is at. You're going to come in with a lot of knowledge about the soil food web and the role of soil biology. Um, and a lot of your clients you're going to work with are also going to assume that maybe you know a lot about the crops that they're growing. You know, well, if you're going to talk to me about soil biology, well, really, what are the little tips and tricks you're going to give to me about, you know, growing tomatoes or growing almonds or growing whatever that, that uh, crop is? Um, and make sure you, you have that kind of dividing line saying, you know, I don't feel comfortable answering that question necessarily that, that they may have asked you because I don't have that skill set. But there's really where I uh, understand or where my knowledge set is at. And one of the best ways I think to, to really express this with your client is to really, you know, form this as more of a partnership when you're working with them that they are very good at growing their crop and understanding their market and understanding the plants that they're growing. You know a lot about the soil biology and the soil food web and what are the, the practices that are going to enhance that. And it's kind of the meeting of minds between your client and yourself to find out what are the best practices um, you know, to, to be able to, to implement on their farm. And you know, one of the tools that I use a lot when I'm working with clients is to say, you know what, let's do a review of your management practices. And and you're going to tell me your management practices, and we're going to evaluate them as far as does it harm the soil biology, is it neutral to them, or is it beneficial? And really, what we could try to do is is to find all of the ones that are harmful to the soil biology and try to find alternatives. Those are our priorities and how we really focus. And I think in that sense, you're having that kind of communication. That's where the farmers really kind of understand that it's really a partnership that, that you're helping them through this process. And then um, lastly, I would say, don't get comfortable with the, the knowledge that you have. You know, this is going to be an ever expanding. Um, there's going to be new science that's always going to be coming out. And, and really try to embrace that. Um, be flexible in your mindset that we're going to start to learn and know more things um, as you know the science definitely evolves and uh, adapt your practices to some of that that new science that's coming out so don't be stagnant in your learning and you know for something like myself part of the, the best parts of the job i think is learning i i love the aspect of of learning new things and then figuring out well oh i just learned this how do i adapt that and and, and how can i i you know make a practice that's going to benefit my clients. Um, so if you're in that kind of mindset where you like to learn, uh, boy, this is the field for you because there's going to be a lot of new science that's coming out. OK, oh, well, I'd just like to thank everybody. Um, and that ends our four presentations uh, talking about uh, the, you know, what the, the day in the life of being a consultant. And there's some great questions that came in, and we're going to, to do some Q&A. But before we do that, we're going to talk about our October uh, promotion. So uh, there's really two packages that, that we're looking at. There's the BioComplete Compost Bundle, and that's going to be kind of geared towards more for farmers and ranchers and growers. Um, and then there's the Consultants Kickstarter bundle, which is going to be more uh, about how do you get training to become a consultant like myself and, and the panelists that, that uh, you just heard from. Um, so significant discounts for our October promotion. And before we watch the video, which is one other thing. So today the, they, the school is offering an additional 10% off. Um, and so there's a code. Um, 
go ahead and I'll leave it up here for a second so you can write that down. It's the extra 10 off and uh, it's about $387 of savings and that coupon does expire tonight. So if you're interested and still haven't signed up, uh, this is a good little additional discount that you can apply. All right, let's go ahead and uh, watch a short video about our promotion and then we'll get into our Q&A. Sorry, let me go back here. If you're interested in joining the soil revolution, this is a great time. With a consultant Kickstarter bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses with Dr. Elaine Ingham for just $38.70, saving over $1,100 through October 20th. You'll also get stage one of the consultant training program totally free, saving a further $15.40. That's 26 hours of mentor time dedicated to helping you make your own biological compost and develop your microscopy skills to the standard required to qualify as a certified soil food web lab technician. You'll also get two free bonuses with this offer, the Introduction to Permaculture course with Graham Bell and the Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse, saving a further $500. The total value of this bundle is over $7,000, for which you'll pay just $38.70, saving over $3,100. That's 45% off. There are limited places available with the Consultant Kickstarter bundle, so please don't delay. In Foundation Course 1, you'll take a deep dive into the science and methodology that underpins the Soil Food Web approach, which was developed by Dr. Elaine Ingham over the last four decades. You'll study the history of soil on planet Earth and how the agricultural practices we've been using in the last hundred years have degraded our soils to the point where we now only have around 60 harvests left, according to the United Nations. You'll learn about the solution to many of the problems that are familiar to farmers all over the world today. Problems like diminishing soil fertility, pest and disease pressure, low crop yields, drought, flooding, compaction, and soil erosion. Regenerative agriculture can address all of these problems. You'll be introduced to regenerative practices like no-till and the use of cover plants. You'll also learn about the four major groups of microorganisms that drive soil regeneration and how the process can be accelerated by restoring the microbial community or soil food web to your client soils. Dr. Elaine will present a number of case studies from around the world that she has worked on personally. Here you'll see some of the amazing results that have been achieved using the Soil Food Web approach. In Foundation Course 2, you will learn all about the importance of biological compost and how it's very different to regular compost. When most people look at compost, they only see a means of delivering nutrients to their plants. So they think about how much nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and other elements are in the compost. When we look at biological compost, we see a means of inoculating the soil with beneficial microorganisms so that the soil ecosystem can start to function again, providing plants with a continual supply of nutrients. This is kind of like teaching someone to fish so they can feed themselves for life as opposed to just giving them a single meal. In this part of the training, you will learn how to make biological compost using various starting materials to create a recipe that will produce results. You'll learn how to monitor and control moisture levels, aeration, and temperature in order to ensure that beneficial microorganisms are multiplied while disease-causing organisms are destroyed or become dormant. You'll also learn about the various types of equipment that can be used at different scales. And you'll learn about the different ways in which biological compost can be applied to the soil. In Foundation Course 3, you'll study Dr. Elaine's methods for making liquid biological soil amendments. Compost extracts are used as a soil drench, delivering microbes deep into the soil profile where they can interact with the plant's root system. Compost teas are applied to the plant's foliage where they form a protective barrier against foliar diseases. In time, as your soil biome becomes more diverse and vigorous, your plants and trees may be entirely covered with beneficial microbes without having to continually apply them. In Foundation Course 4, you'll focus on four major groups of microorganisms in the soil food web, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. You'll learn how to use a compound microscope to identify and quantify these microbes so that you can really see what's going on in your compost and in the soil. This will give you the ability to assess the quality of your compost and liquid amendments before you invest all the time and effort that is required to apply them to the soil. 
You will also be able to monitor the progress of the microbial community in your soil over time. So if something is going wrong, you will know about it before the plants start to suffer. This gives you the opportunity to take remedial action early on in the growing season. In stage one of the consultant training program, you'll be assigned to one of our highly skilled mentors, some of whom are soil food web consultants who run their own businesses supporting farmers to make the transition to the soil food web approach. And others are PhD biologists who have been working closely with Dr. Ingham for several years. You'll work one-on-one -on -one with your mentor to develop your compost making and microscopy skills. When it comes to making great biological compost, there are many variables and every situation is different. Our mentors have worked with dozens of students making compost in many different conditions, so they'll be able to help you address some of these challenges that are unique to your location. They'll also guide you to avoid making common mistakes that can cost you lots of time, money, and effort. Your mentor will support you as you develop your skills to the required standard to pass the microscopy proficiency assessment. Achieving this standard will give you the confidence to really know what's happening in the microbial community in your compost and soil. You'll be able to identify and quantify the four major groups of microbes in the soil in about an hour or less. Once you successfully pass the microscopy proficiency assessment, you can elect to be listed on our website as a certified soil food web lab tech, which means that you can assess soil samples for other farmers and growers in your region. You'll have a total of 26 hours of mentor time so you can arrange Zoom calls and exchange emails with your mentor whenever you feel you need help. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for watching our promotional video. And now we're gonna move on to our Q&A portion. So let me just refresh here. There we go. All right. So panelists, if you guys can go off mute um, and we're going to go ahead and get into our uh, questions. So the first question was, as an SFW consultant, does it matter where you live in order to get work slash project opportunities? Is there a demand for SFW consultants in Texas or Maine? What say you panelists? I'd say absolutely. Um, <laughs> we have um, um, consultants in Texas. Uh, and I believe we have one in Maine, several in Texas. Um, so when you get finished taking the coursework and you understand the, uh, the uh, steps that we take and the last class that we want you to take before you get to hang out your, sh your shingle is um, to actually make compost that would be good for your part of the world in the biome that you already live in. We want to maximize the diversity of those microorganisms in the compost that you make. So then when you extract the compost, you're going to get that maximum diversity into that liquid form that you can apply into the soil, or you can make a tea with it. And then you have something that will glue itself to the surfaces of your plants above ground. Um, so you learn those particular things in your part of the world. You don't have to have a mentor or a person um, you know, looking over your shoulder who lives in exactly the same place that you do. So the principles are all the same. Some of the seasonality, like uh, Brian ta talked about, um, are very important to understand. So you dig into what those changes might be. So then we're going to expect that not only are you going to make a compost that works for the land that you're going to be working in, but we want to make certain you know how to make an extract so you can be injecting those organisms into the soil so you can be constantly increasing those diversities of organisms in the compost um, and then making tea as well. Um, so you have all the tools. Now you won't have experienced every nuance and every way that Mother Nature is going to be driving us crazy in the next, um, you know, 50, 100 years. I mean, we've ignored Mother Nature so long that she's just not going to put up with it anymore. So um, I don't know how many of you read the latest um, United Nations report about the world is very close to irreversible climate breakdown. And we are. Um, we have a chance to get it reversed before it goes perhaps over that edge, but we don't have long. So we are needed to, to get out there, everybody, 
and start making these changes. Stop using inorganic fertilizers. There's no reason to do that. Don't be using pesticides. Don't be using the toxic chemicals that you've been told are the only way we can feed the world. We have never had a shortage of food on this planet. We've had a shortage of transporting the food to the hungry people. That's what we've had a shortage about. So we can get those people to grow their own. No matter how horrible and awful the conditions are, we know how to reverse deserts from continuing be to become even worse. We know how to um, make, get the biology back into the soil, no matter what kind of diseases or pests you have. It takes a little practice, but you can do it. So yeah, and so there's Tishi go over, Tisha over there going he he he. Yeah. <laughs> a little practice. Define a little practice, Elaine. <laughs> But it's interesting when we started consulting, it's like I, I some days I would love it if, if if all of our work was just in Nevada County, you know, but like listen to Miles' story, listen to Brian. I mean, you're gonna hear it echoed through all of us. Um once people start knowing who you are, uh your home kind of turns into wherever your work is, unfortunately, fortunately, you know. So um I don't know a lot of consultants that just sit in one spot. Um almost every consultant I know is either traveling virtually like Elaine mentioned online just zooming with everyone and you know working with other labs to you know, make the work happen or we're flying and driving, you know, all the time. All the time. And it's it just it, yeah, it, the, your uh, global trotting yes. just <laughs> increases all the time. It's you know in the next couple of months I'm I will be in possibly be in Sri Lanka. I definitely will be in Brazil. I will be in uh, a, a number of the Southeast Asia. I've been invited to come to South Africa again. So <laughs> it just it continues to expand. You're needed and you make a name for yourself and you know, do a good job, have success, and you're going to be invited to go to incredible places. I always think of it as uh, someone is paying my way for me to go and see all those archaeological digs and those incredible you know buildings and all the these storied places and they're paying me to go there it's vacation we Workation. call it <laughs> Workation. Yeah. That's a great term. i guess yep. i guess specific specificity to the question of like location you, you know, like name one state that doesn't grow a crop, you know, and you, like it, it's everywhere, like food and agriculture is everywhere. It's, you know, um, so I don't think it necessarily matters. I mean, you mentioned it's like Texas, for instance, but yes, you're going to there's people always in every system that are stuck in this old way. And there's no point wasting your time trying to convince them otherwise is go to people that are already actually gravitating towards this. And like, you know, you spend less of your time arguing with people because arguing is not going to get you anywhere. Showing people is what's going to happen. You know, if you have a neighbor, one, one person who's wanting to like get into this kind of growing system, they start doing it this way. Now their neighbor's going to look over the fence and say, well, what are you doing? How much did you spend on yada, yada, yada? And they're like, well, I actually saved a bunch of money this year and grew a better crop, you know? And that's how this word is going to spread. And like I said, like, Food is everywhere. So, you know, there's always an end no matter where you're stationed at. And it is spreading already. The information is getting out that we are successful at what we're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you know, also, just besides food, I mean, if you live in a dense urban environment where there's not a lot of large scale agriculture around you, there is still a lot of growing systems, both in, I mean, there's a lot of people who want the residential yards not to have all the chemicals. They don't want their kids running out on their lawns where they just sprayed a bunch of, you know, pesticides, herbicides, or whatever, you know, side you want to talk about. And then if you live in an environment that is, let's say, mountainous and, and but the ecosystem of the forest is really run down, there's going to be ecosystem uh, restoration projects all over. So, so don't just get locked into, if there's not a farm by me. There's a lot of different growing systems that, that you can have access to uh, that need this kind of work, uh, really. I mean, the only spot that I know of right now that, that probably doesn't need our work is Antarctica. <laughs> given 100 years, maybe maybe so. Maybe it's be a... Oh, a given climate. climate change, it's going to be about 10 years from now we're going to be growing exactly. stuff in the Antarctic. Arctic, yeah. Greenland, finally. Um, so, yeah. Uh, what was I going to say? It'll come back to me. 
<laughs> uh, Miles, Alan, uh, anything you guys want to add before we move to the next question? Uh, I think you guys covered that pretty well. Just generally, you know, work begets more work. So if you're in a localization, you don't want to leave that area. Um, start small, start with somebody who you can demonstrate what you can do. And usually that'll start to bring in more work in that area. People start to notice what's happening. And generally, that's the best way to kind of grow out business. So, um, you know, you might have to do some rooting around to find that first client that's willing to work with you. And that might not be something you do with a massive profit or anything like that, but you need to build your skills. They're going to need to see that it works um, and start there and, and kind of grow it out naturally if you want to stay within Maine, Texas, that type of like space. And if you're in an urban situation, you can find um, gardeners. It's like in New York City. Every single borough has its own, um, you know, they do public works, um, they, at the botanical garden, there we go. And cool. you can go and start giving classes there. Um, you could you know, pe teach people just the microscope part of it if that's what you wanted to do. But they have made a policy to go to all of the empty lots in, um, in in New York City, and you'll find the same kind of program in Chicago and in Dallas and in other places where they are going to the empty lots and converting them into edible gardens. If that's where you want to get your start, I mean, if those are the people you want to influence, there you are. Just go start attending some of their meetings. Go to grower meetings, you know, people who grow corn or wheat or barley you'll get a certain percentage of them that will listen to you because they too believe they too understand that we don't need inorganic fertilizers we've already got all the nutrients we need in the soil all right ellen anything you want to add you're good to go Alan's having audio issues, so uh, yeah. he's actually not able to hear what's going on. Oh, okay, sure, sure. So we're trying no, to solve no, it. Yeah, no, no problem. So okay. we'll leave Alan on the side for the moment, and then once Alan pops in, it'll be great. All right, let's we, go ahead. And, yeah. We understand that he's not trying to avoid us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fine, Alan, don't answer our questions. Yeah, I don't know. Aaron's in here. <laughs> Okay, so the next question is from Rob, <clears throat> and Rob says, Aloha, I'm pretty new to farming and even gardening. I've been doing work trade on an organic farm here in Kauai for the past nine months, and this is my first experience. I have a passion for this work, but have very limited experience. Can this program quickly bring me to the experience and knowledge I need to make a life out of this? Well, since we're all graduate so at school, what do you guys say, panelists? <laughs> I, I want to like go away from the question for a second and say, Rob, please do this and please make good compost in Hawaii because I've had on multiple, multiple occasions, people calling me and asking me to smuggle compost to Hawaii, which is like, really <laughs> illegal. I can't do it. I said no, um, but like the islands need a compost producer and I feel like there just isn't one there. Um, I don't know anyone making good compost there and they need it. So, um, you know, the only the people I know who are making good compost in Hawaii use it all for themselves so, and their friends of course they yeah. do. <laughs> so they've got the best reputation for the greatest food but rob you can come along and um start this for your own set of uh, restaurants who will pay you a pretty penny for all those wonderful foods that you will grow for them and the flavor that it gives yeah well one thing i just say rob you know my experience of having my homestead um, you know, I, I didn't really have a very limited knowledge about soil biology before I started to understand about the soil food web. But once I understood it, I started making those changes to my property and to my homestead and really saw, you know, significant changes fairly quickly. Um, so yes, I, I, I think you can, um, you know, take the knowledge that you learn and then go ahead and apply them to, let's say that farm that you're working at. Um, and yeah, they can happen pretty quick. Yeah, and of course, I would add to that. Sorry. Go um, ahead. I've already I had just, my chance. <laughs> okay. I would just add to that that sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, so when you're looking to make improvements like that and you don't have a baseline to start off or a direction to point in, um, that's something that this class can really help with is it gives you the tools and background you need to start making those improvements and really start trying things out. Um, you know, if, if you don't have that baseline of even how to evaluate the products you're working with, 
uh, you know, don't know how to make a biological amendment um, or start to get involved with some of those more regenerative practices, it's difficult to really make progress. So, um, you know, having that baseline foundational knowledge to springboard off of can really help for starting to build out a program that works for you. Yeah. Great. Okay, anything else to add panelists before we move on? All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question is from Wendy. And Wendy says, what to cover a small compost pile with? I don't want to use plastic, but aren't there glues and other nasties in cardboard? And I think this was coming up, Keish and Casey, when you guys were showing pictures of your compost lot. And I saw a lot of questions in the chat, like, oh my gosh, are they covering that compost with plastic? Do you guys want to talk about the covers that you use? So I would say for small home piles, like the best thing you can do is go to the thrift store and buy a cotton fitted sheet. Like there's tons of them available. It's breathable material, it's organic material, and it will break down eventually. But you can go back to the thrift store and buy another one for 50 cents. Um, you know, if you're just doing like small at home composting, it's like the best material. It can look a little bit trashy depending on your selection of sheets. But, uh, <laughs> your SpongeBob me. sheets are going to work. I, mean, I try to get the craziest sheets possible. It might look trashy to each we, we started calling them comp ghosts because they look like, like a sheet out in the woods. It looks super weird, but it's a great place to go and lie down, and you know, especially wintertime, kind of get in where it's nice and toasty, warm. <laughs> draw eyes and scary mouths on them whenever they're piled very tall um and then for for large scale we actually it's it's so expensive to buy fabric um that there's no way that we, we have to use something that's synthetic um because our compost actually the biology and it just eats uh it eats a t-shirt pretty quickly like if you stick underwear in there they're gone um so we use a poly fabric which isn't something we're really proud of but it is uv resistant and it does keep out, um, you know, it keeps the wind from drying the piles out. We get extraordinarily dry conditions, a lot of wind, and then we get a lot of rain. So our piles protect from, our covers protect from rain, from wind, and, and from dry. So, and they're more and animals too. Animals love compost. Like you'll see even your small pile. I just got, we just got back to our house here um, in Southern California. My compost pile that I've made has been completely flattened to the ground by wild animals. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the covers do more than just, uh, just keep rain out. Yeah, and also like the covers that you saw in the photos, they're not solid plastic. It's, it's more of like a felt material. So it's super breathable, but it can still, you know, allow a little bit of air in and out, allows a little bit of moisture out and a little bit of moisture in, but kind of just helps regulate, you know, the compost pile. And they're also light in color. So like most composts that you can, covers that you can buy are black. Like the one company that makes them in North America are black. And we've taken heat guns when it's 110 outside the surface of your compost pile is like 160 degrees so it's our composting temperatures just from the solar radiation so we went with a lighter color to kind of help refract some of that heat and not have to water it so much yeah there are nasties in cardboard I'm reading or that we just don't know with cardboard some companies are going to make normal cardboard uh, and others are going to be using inks um, and possibly even disinfectants, disinfectants with COVID. Uh, Amazon regularly will spray all their boxes with some sort of antimicrobial something. So we're not super hip on the cardboard anymore, although it will compost and break down. So. I like it, making my garden walks with a <laughs> underneath is a cardboard. Somewhere you don't want plants growing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think we nailed that one. Yeah, I think you guys did too. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> there, was, there was I saw a lot of chat about, oh my gosh, using plastics, but you guys, I think you guys just nailed it. You described exactly the purpose of it, and you do need those covers. You know, I, I can tell you, in Northern California, where they're at, you get humidity down into the single digits, and wow, you'll lose a lot of moisture out of those compost piles pretty quick. You don't. Have well, and there was something on. about tropical climates too, and it's just like I've never seen anything, you know, just take life in the pile away faster than it being flooded for too long. So right. you don't want dry compost, you don't want wet. That whole Goldilocks principle covers people for you, so you don't have to be a crazy person um, babysitting your compost pile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other comments, panelists, before we move on to the next question? Okay, so let's move on to the next. 
Hey, Brian, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Alan, you're back. Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> We've been missing it, Alan. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's like I just quit on me and I went, okay, why? <laughs> and, yeah, uh, exactly. My phone. <laughs> you, you had your backup technology. Good, good, uh, good, good point. God. Okay, uh, next question is uh, How do you explain the difference between biocomplete compost and fertilizer? Is there any place for traditional NPK fertilizers and or trace elements once the compost has been applied? What say you, panelists? No. That's <laughs> very simple. Somebody else uh, answered first. <laughs> <laughs> there is no need. It's You don't need those inorganic fertilizers. Uh, you know, that the green revolution is based on the fact that they had already killed all of the organisms in their soil they were trying to grow plants in dirt and you will not be successful trying to do that you will have to do the inorganic fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and all of those toxics which end up in killing your children or your great-grandchildren or whatever um not going to have a planet to live on if we don't um, switch things around so try to stay away the only time I would probably say to a, a, one of your clients or my clients is if they haven't been able to make a really good compost. Well, then get what you can out there and then use a very small amount, you know, because like um, nitrogen fertilizer is usually, you, you know, you are going to be putting out around 450 pounds per acre is a typical, very typical um, recommendation from chemical purveyors and you can probably just move a decimal point you know so instead of um, 450 you're going to put 45 um, pounds down per acre um, okay so you've re reduced the blow to your organisms in that soil and then as soon as you can as soon as you see that your plants are starting to take up the nitrogen, they, they're starting to look a little bit better because they're finally not nutrient de, um, deprived, then you want to go right back in with another application of the compost extract onto the soil, make sure it infiltrates into the soil so that you're getting those organisms down as deep as possible and then they can start recovering your soil turn your soil back and turn your dirt back into soil once again. And by the time you come around to year two, I have not seen places where, you know, if they've been doing a good job, they're um, putting out the organisms and they're testing to make sure that they've got all the organisms that are supposed to be there, which means maybe you'll apply a compost extract two or three times during the growing season in the first year. So that by the end of that growing season, you will have a go good soil food web. Come the beginning of the next growing season, you just check and make sure you've got all the organisms that you need. So there's just, there's no need for herbicides or fungicides or nematicides or all those wonderful acidal things. Um, there's just no need for them once you get the biology going. Yeah, I think this is where education comes as a, a really important factor when you're working with clients. You know, a lot of farmers that I'm working with that are really, you know, multi-generational in the agrochemical space, um, you know, they're very used to the whole, I take a soil chemistry report, or I take a tissue analysis, and then here's my amount of fertilizer that I apply. It's very prescriptive in that sense. Um, and you need to really educate them that the when you're putting in these inorganic fertilizers um, or pesticides or fungicides, whatever it is, you're setting the biology back. And so if our goal is to really try to have the soil food web take over and do that nutrient cycling, well, those things are going to not allow for us to progress as fast as we want to. And so you, you have to have that kind of knowledge base with them uh, in that sense. Now, I saw farmers that are very still beholden to that. But what we'll do is we'll say, all right, well, let's use some tools like plant sap analysis or tissue analysis to show you that, you know, the soil food web is establishing. We are doing nutrient cycling. Your need for those inorganic fertilizers is going down. And if we can, you know, do reduction, like Elaine was saying, well, what if we move the decimal point? We cut it in half. We cut it in, you know, three quarters out in the first year. 
All right, well, that means they put a lot less of those products onto the field, which allows your soil biology to establish even faster. So it's that, that transitional period that you really need to be smart with your clients and make sure that they have the right set of knowledge as well to understand why we're doing that reduction, why we're getting those out of the equation. Uh, I think it's really, really important. Panelists, anything else you guys want to add? Yeah, yeah we, we work a lot. Oops, sorry. That case, go for it. Casey, Casey. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't mind. Yeah, we, we work a lot in mixed systems, so conventional mixed with biological. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of working through mitigation strategy for how to move away from different chemical products. Um, a lot of farms don't have the luxury. If you go from full chemical to biological and you have weeds pop up, it's not like they can just necessarily hand weed the whole thing to deal with it immediately. So there is a middle ground in transition periods between point A to point B. Um, you know, we see a lot of really good results utilizing biology and reduced fertilizer applications. We see really good results with using biology, even with full fertilizer loads, uh, optimizing that nutrient usage and flow to the plant. Um, so, you know, a big piece of that is what does the client want? Um, we have clients that we move all the way to like organic regenerative with no synthetic fertilizer, no chemical usage. We have clients that don't want to do that. Um, and so the question becomes, how do we then integrate a system that's healthier, integrate a system that can really reduce the reliance and usage of those different systems, and then put the infrastructure in place to be able to move away from the more taxing and damaging systems and chemicals that they're using. So, um, you know, on, on our end, we do a lot of mixed work where, you know, if we can maybe transition from doing fertilizer to the soil and instead do it through a foliar, um, that's a way to reduce damage going to the root zone, um, stuff like that, where you can find different solutions to problems and find sort of that happy middle ground with some growers that don't have the interest of going all the way to a fully regenerative type of system. Keisha Casey, I think you guys have something to add as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that there are a lot of options for food that are not synthetic fertilizers, you know, whole foods, kelps, fish. Um, so, you know, sometimes we're able to, we have a few clients that have actually taken on using like fish hydrolysate at, you know, at scale, which it's not cheap um, <laughs> compared to the chemical stuff, but um, there are other ways to boost during transition if, if it's possible and you can get those kind of amendments where you're at. Yeah, the transition is one of the most critical parts that we have with our clients. You know, how how do we help them make that change while also still maintaining their profitability, still maintaining crops and things like that? And that that is where we we make our money. I think is 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 and how quickly can we do that to, to move them over to those systems is important. When you're looking at their soils um, and they're doing a soil chemistry uh, assessment, look at the organic matter box and really to have the organisms be able to take over and and not be kind of trying to help as they can but you know it's not quite completely all there make certain that that soil organic matter is up above three percent yeah and, and there's um, so many agricultural soils that i see 0. 0.2 0. 0.3 i mean <laughs> it is just there's no organic matter in the soil at all i mean it's just such a small amount it's so, not soil it's Dirt. dirt if you're less definitely dirt <laughs> yep, definitely dirt you just can't have the growth of the microorganisms that you need so you know, how do you get organic matter back into the soil it's called compost so all that great organic material <clears throat> that you're putting in with the right sets of microorganisms it's you're getting double duty on um, one application so get it moved along as fast as you can um, don't remove uh, uh, the uh, residues at the end of the growing season. Don't pick up all of that good carbon and haul it away someplace because it's the microorganisms are carbon limited. They, they can get all the nutrients that they want, but where, what they may well be lacking in is organic matter. And so make sure that you apply the biology onto the surface of that residue material in the fall after you've harvested it everything and then as those organisms chew on all of that plant material and turn it into soil organic matter they're also building infiltration for you at the same time right 
It, it, I'll just use a, a quick aside too. I have a client where we're very low organic matter. We're trying to increase organic matter. And this is in a nut crop where they have bare floors because of the way they harvest, they shake nuts under the ground, they sweep it up. And so they want at the harvest stage, very, very bare floors. And there was a kind of a, a dialogue going on of people were planting cover crops in the middles of these trees. And, um, you know, they would mow it, but a lot of the residues weren't breaking down. And so these farmers were having a lot of trash in, inside of their, their, um, their nuts. So that was a concern when I was working with, the, with my client. But what we did is we added compost extract after we had crimped and rolled all of the cover crop. And voila, those things broke down. By the time we got to harvest, most of the residues were completely broken down and now incorporated as humus into the soil. And uh, the farmer's like, wow, uh, this worked. <laughs> like, yeah, because we added biology <laughs> into the equation. That was the missing component for the other farmers in the area that were having troubles uh, with planting cover crops. So, okay, anything else, uh, panelists, you want to add before we move on? Okay, next question. Uh, this question is from Amanda, and Amanda says, I want to build sustainable landscape management practices for HOA and commercial landscapes. I believe the care and feeding of the soil under the millions of acres of turf grass can be part of the solution too. My question is, do you think the lessons in SFW would be applicable to my goal? Everyone's always talking about farming. And if you guys don't mind, I like to take this one because I... One of my big clients is actually a landscaping. Uh, it's it's a it's a property management company that owns the, the largest amount of commercial property in Southern California, and they are very committed to making a big change into changing the way they do landscaping into uh, landscaping with biology. And um, so yes, I think landscaping is a very very important part of this equation. And one of the, the, the really big reasons why they want to make this change is because the amount of, uh, or the limited amount of, of water that they're getting access to. They need to have much higher water holding capacity in the soil. And, you know, this company recognizes that, yes, the, um, you know, the way to go about this is to establish a really strong soil food web so we can aggregate the soil, build really good soil structure. Um, and so they're highly committed into doing this type of work. Yeah, I know speaking for myself, Brian, in Florida, uh, I've been getting a lot of business lately, uh, mainly from landscape architects where, where you know, in the past, they when you ever do a, a new house uh, or any kind of like site or common area or whatever, there's a tendency to like completely denude the, the site and then grade it and compact it, you know, and then plant sod on it and, and shrubs or whatever. And then like a year later, two years later, they wonder why everything's failing. And so they, they've had enough of it. Um, so now uh, I've got clients now, or, or this one particular client is I, I get a description of what they do prior to planting. And it's in incorporating a lot of uh, organic matter, a lot of um, compost into the soil as a bed prep. It's like, you know, when you build a house, you want to build a strong foundation for your house. But, but you know, if you don't build a good foundation for your house, it's going to collapse. So that's kind of the, no different than in the soil. And so it's this now catching on and, they, and now they're, you know, um, they're, they're all the, the shrub beds are getting mixed in with some good, a really significant amount of organic matter. Not too much. You don't want to overdo it because you can get in trouble with too much organic matter. Um, but so I've started to have some great business success as well as some, you know, success in that department. I would add one of our large clients is an HOA here in Southern California. And I, I just love them as a client like, for multiple reasons. First of all, we have access to an entire community um, and we get to go. So the HOA will pay us to come in and do talks, educational things to, um, you know, drive around and like overall assess the yards from the street. Um, they also will call us in to help design community spaces to be more thoughtful about how the water flows, what plants are gonna go there, like how we're considering biology while also creating spaces for people. And then on top of that, um, as the HOA is promoting us, everyone that lives inside of that neighborhood that's willing to show up, I mean, they they kind of, they get a taco truck on the night we talk. So people show up because there's tacos and margaritas, <laughs> but um, you know, those people come and listen, they get excited. And then those are more clients. And then, you know, they talk to other neighborhoods and it's, it's, it's a nice little uh, connection piece to the community and a, and a good way to make money. Actually. Um, we really love working with HOAs. <laughs> yeah. One of our colleagues, Todd Harrington, um, 
a lot of his business really that um, you know he's made big successes from was doing residential. He he still has his large residential um, you know operation. Uh, so yeah, I think landscaping is is definitely a very significant part of the equation. All right, anybody else want to add anything to this question? Yeah, it's it's any any time anyone is growing a plant, um, that's where we should be getting involved. So hydroponics, where everything's in under glass or under plastic, and you've got to be moving your water around to the uh, plants, you maybe even add a fish tank to it all. So I've worked with people in Australia, up around Darwin and Ingham, where um, huge size tanks with uh, uh, different, all kinds of different fish in it. Fish all tend to poop at dawn and at dusk. And that means you have a massive load of nitrates moving into the stream of water that's now going to go on your plants. If you don't do something to deal with that excess nitrogen, um, you're going to kill your plants. So you have to learn about all of the things that go on. It's a nice, great community. Uh, you just run your um, liquid material coming out of the fish tank through a compost and you remove the high nitrogens, the high nitrates and ammonias. Um, and that means uh, plenty of good nutrients in a plant available form present in the water that goes by the root systems of your plant. So it doesn't really matter what kind of plant you're growing, tropics, temperate, you know, pretty soon here we'll, we'll be able to um, go uh, plant things in the Arctic circle <laughs> if we don't <laughs> do something about it quick. Um, yeah, not a good we, sign. Yeah, we, we'd all want to move up there, wouldn't we? Um, so uh, it's applicable to anything that you're looking at when you're growing plants. Agreed. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and we'll make this a quick one. Um, this one's from Megan. Could the speakers address how particular they are about clients they take? What clients do they chase away and why? And what clients would they turn away and why? What is their favorite story of finding a client? So we only have a few minutes left, so I'll have to make it kind of short here. But I love this question, actually. <laughs> Panelists, <laughs> anybody want to start? I'll start, like Brian. I'm thinking about one of your clients. <laughs> so Brian has a client that he sent to us. This is before we were consulting, but it was for compost and he showed up and he, he's a farmer himself. And he very defiantly told us how expensive our compost was and how he thought that it was probably a big waste of his time and money, even driving up to pick it up, but that he'd met a consultant in Brian Vogg and he's going to go ahead and try this stuff. And uh, that maybe in the future, we might be seeing him again. <laughs> so often when we encounter this type of uh, attitude, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to run towards that client. But since he was picking up compost and there's not too much involved, we went ahead and sold him some and he left. He comes and visits us monthly now. We know his daughter. We know his family. We go out to his farm. We all work together. And he's one of our best clients. And it. So it's, it's, it's funny in the beginning, you don't always know, like the, you know, the more challenging people might end up being the, the largest, the biggest joy to work with. Um, yeah. But in general, if somebody's already really um, obviously not taking on what we're saying and, and feeling, you know, if there's a lot of pushback, pushback we're, we're not running towards them. We're trying to work with the people that want to work with us. And very luckily for us, that's, they just come to us. So um, in our line of work, we've, we've been fortunate. Yeah. to not have to make those decisions too often. <laughs> I, sometimes, I sometimes wish that we could make all of the clients coming in take a personality test. <laughs> so you could just delete those ones that are going to be like leeches sucking life's blood out of you without ever returning anything. Um, so yeah. those you want to learn to avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, and you can really gauge uh, clients by their uh, several things. One is their 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 total and th their enthusiasm in the subject. And I've had a few of those that are just all they're all excited about this whole soil biology thing. And, and they and they kind of starting to drink the Kool Aid. So they're they really do they just don't know how to do it. And that's where they hire you. Um, I know that uh, as much as I want to help 
uh, like an individual homeowner, um, you know, that you, you are running a business and, you know, they, they really can't, um, so a lot of homeowners can't afford much of a fee. And I try to do a real simple, inexpensive fee, just like a one soil test and one uh, assessment on the email report, try to make it as quick as possible. I don't want to turn away everybody, but sometimes you do have to be a little judicious about who you take on. But obviously you want to take on clients that, that you think uh, have the ability to pay. That's important. You are running a business. Um, but, um, but again, the, the good news, I will say that the exciting thing about what we're doing is that we're on the, we're on the beginning of this. I mean, the Dr. Green's been doing it for a long time, but we're arguably in the beginning of this industry. And so you're starting to get these people that are starting to uh, hear about it and then they get really excited and then, um, they, but they don't know how to solve the problem. And luckily our soil food web website, um, allows you to do that. I was just telling the group earlier today that um, I, since I got certified in June, and my I'm like the only guy in the southeast, which is really kind of good for me. Um, <laughs> I've had uh, you know two two ref referrals in the last like two months, and uh, well, I just finished the project, um, and then I'm getting ready to start another one with a citrus grower in Florida. So um, it, it's it, it's I think it's it's the fat. And the, and the interesting thing is the client I just finished with, he, he's tried everything else. He's tried John Kemp's message and everything. And he says, I just can't get my lettuce to grow. What's I think soil biology is the last thing. And uh, an assessment of his soils and they were completely devoid of biology. They had a lot of bacteria, which we see a lot when in bad soils and the nutrients just weren't, weren't getting released. And so biology was his problem. And so that's where I came in and, and made a lot of recommendations, actually sold him, you know, some, some compost. A la UPS, which was not a cheap, you know, shipping cost, but um, that's he can't get it anywhere else. So I actually sent him some some of my own compost to Mississippi, and um, and he's super excited about it. And I'm looking forward to hearing the results back from that. Great. Anybody else want to add anything before we close? Uh, I would just say that like my best clients are the clients that are dedicated to making a change on their farms. Um, you know, the ones that get the best result really give a lot themselves into the process. Um, you know, then you can move slower with people that want to make a change that see it as, you know, it's something they want to do, but they don't want to lose X, Y, Z profitability. It's the reasons for making those changes can, can be really strong motivators for people to move along faster or slower. Um, but generally speaking, anybody who reaches out to you directly is going to be interested in trying to make that type of change in a system, right? So uh, unless you're out there really chasing people down and for like twisting their arm and forcing them, um, you just, you don't want to be in a spot where you're fighting me versus you and trying to like prove your point. You want somebody who's going to at least be able to say, okay, how can we make this work together? Um, you don't want that friction. So <laughs> any client that's willing to work with you and not against you is generally a perfectly fine person to work with. Yeah, and the one thing I add too is that um, the clients have two options. They can either hire you to solve their problem and pay you a lot of money, or you can teach them how to do it themselves. And I, I prefer, and you know, if a client is necessarily balking about your, your fee, I'll say, well, listen, I'll make a deal with you. I'll teach you how to do it, but you got to pay me to educate you how to do it. Because ultimately, I, I, this is me speaking now, but I want my clients to be self sufficient where they can do it themselves. And I love getting the business, but I also want them to be not reliant on other people. I want them to be independent and in charge of their own destiny. So that's. And if you kind of yeah, put it all together and you say, let's see, you, you need 36 hours for the foundation course um, times my fee, which is $250 an hour. So the total fee for having me come out and teach you by, you know, on your own is some ungodly amount of money. Yeah, that's what it's worth. Right. Okay. Um, well, I see we're a few minutes past, so it's probably time for us to go ahead and uh, shut this webinar down. And this was our last in the October promotion. We'll have another, I think, promotional uh, series of webinars in the January timeframe. Um, but I just also like to give a lot of thanks to the, uh, the all the, the people who support us in making these webinars work. Tremendous team behind us that uh, work our IT, our sales, our marketing, um, and you know we really want to thank those people because they put in a lot of hard work to make these uh, these promotional webinars really really sing. 
Um, Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, all of you. Uh, Ignacio. (laughs) Couldn't do this without you. Yeah, Allison. Alex. Oh, I almost forgot. Two of the big players. Exactly. Right. Um, and then also like to thank the panelists uh, today for, for your graciously sharing the knowledge and the passion that you have and be able to tell your story. I think it's really important for folks to be able to see that, that yes, this work is happening and it can be done. Um, and we need more consultants out there doing this kind of work. We have a lot of acreage to transform um, and it takes, it's going to take a lot of hands and minds to be able to do that work. So thank you panelists for, for attending and sharing your information and Dr. Leningham, thank you for all the work that you do. I know you're mentors to all of us and a big inspiration for, for what we do. So thank you for all your hard work, uh, and the decades that you put into this. So. And the hostess with the most is yes, Brian Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now it's time for lunch. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> oh, then, it's time to eat. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Ciao. Take care, y'all. Yeah, thank Ciao. You. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.